A 20-something Soma Sagar traveled alone halfway around the world to get advanced degrees in the field of his passion. But rather than a Ph.D. in computer science, he got a nearly 27-year career on the bow wave of the personal computer era. He also got a lifetime of learning about what it takes to build great teams. In the last episode, we explored his journey and his passion for leadership. This time, we learned about how he worked to establish global development centers at Microsoft. Turns out, changing a headquarters-centric high-touch culture toward remote work is not easy. But the lessons he learned can teach us all a thing or two now that COVID-19 has forced virtually all knowledge work to retreat to home. We also explore the decision he made to walk away after over a quarter of a century and toward a field he knew very little about. He tells us how it followed a personal theme of consistently looking ahead. Through this decision, he tells us about his move into the world of venture capitalism and what his world looks like there. And that's what this is all about. This is Leading Smart, the show about managing in the brain power age. It's a field guide to the joys and challenges of leading and working in the modern workplace. I'm Chris Williams, your guide to the stories and ideas that I hope will inspire you to be a better leader in the world of knowledge work. This episode wraps up our conversation with a thoughtful and compelling leader. This is episode 224, part two of my conversation with Soma Sagar. In part one of our conversation, Soma reflected on his journey and how he learned to lead. In this episode, we begin with his passion for turning Microsoft into a distributed development company to build the muscle of remote work. This was driven primarily because he knew intuitively that to hire the best people, you have to go where the talent is. I can't tell you why kind of thing. But I had always been passionate about it. And if you go back to the very early days of Microsoft, you would remember this, right? Microsoft had this philosophy of like, you know, hey, if I can see you, I trust you. If I can't see you, I don't care who, who you are. I don't know who the hell you are. Forget it. It doesn't matter, right? So we grew up in an environment where we felt like, you know, hey, we were such a special company, such a great company that if you wanted to be a part of us, you would pack your bags and no matter where you are, you will come to Redmond. That's how we grew as a company, right? And that worked really, 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 really well for the first 10 years, for the first 15 years, maybe even 20 years kind of thing. But even in the early 90s, I felt that like, you know, hey, that's a, that's a faulted strategy, okay? There is no way you're going to be able to get every bright and smart person who should be at Microsoft to come to Redmond. That's just not going to work. So or later, we're going to hit a brick wall. I don't know when we're going to hit the brick wall, Maybe 1995, maybe 2005, maybe 2050. I have no idea when we hit the brick wall, but we are going to hit the brick wall. So as much as like, you know, we want a critical mass of people to come to Redmond, we have to go to different parts of the world. And I remember like starting in 94, I think, I was like making you know, a pitch to like, you know, hey, we should do something here. We should do something there. And I, like, you know, obviously, given I'm from India, I was sort of using India as a place to say like, you know, hey, there's a lot of English-speaking people, educated people. Computer science is on the rise here. You know, there is a cost advantage, at least in the short term, right? Why aren't we taking advantage of that, right? You're sure we'll continue to get people from India to be part of Microsoft, but we are not going to get a billion people from <laughs> India to be part of Microsoft, right? Or even whatever the number of computer science talented people are, right? So, but it took me like, you know, three years. And for Bill to make his first trip to India and come back, before we finally got Microsoft to say, like, you know, hey, 
uh, go experiment okay and i still remember this very well right so bill goes to india i think it was in march of 97 kind of thing for a week or so and he meets with customers with all the leaders blah blah and he does his usual stuff and he comes back and and, and i was talking to him at the time saying like you know bill how was your experience in the first time in india what did you like what did you not like kind of thing and he said like you know i never realized there were so many talented people in india <laughs> and i said i'm glad you said that okay but he said like you no know, hey always knew that the the people from india that we have in microsoft are very sharp very bright doing very well but i didn't realize we had so many of those people in india i said yeah india is a large country and we know billion people can kind i of think right but that was definitely a, a huge factor in bill because like uh, until then he had only heard from me and others about like you know oh we should do something here but just for him being on you know, a feet on the ground seeing first hand the kinds of people and the kinds of like you know talent and what is possible there Uh, I remember Bill then said like you know okay I'm going to give you 20 head count okay that's how much you know you can go spend I don't know what you're going to do go figure out what we need to do okay that's how we started like you know hey what became in my mind like you know a uh, uh, more of a Microsoft being a distributed development company as opposed to everything is going to happen in Redmond kind of thing. I remember distinctly when you got those 20 head count and you and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out. how do we pay these people how do we work this out what is the you know are there people from here that go back is that I, I, oh boy that was a complicated <laughs> set of things to work on it's fascinating to know that there's 8000 people in india now which is twice as many people as there were when you started at microsoft whatever it was 30 years ago i will admit to being wrong Um I always felt that your passion for doing that was as much to I mean yes of course it was to tap that that talent pool there but I also felt like in some ways it was also for you to provide an opportunity for people who had come to Microsoft to go back and be with their families and many of those other things I guess I never really thought about it um as you thinking about microsoft being a distributed company that early and that was from your that was early in your thinking yeah and 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 to me i always uh, told this to my to bill and to microsoft kind of thing right now hey we will not be successful if we continue believing that like you know anybody and everybody will want to come to redmond there is going to be a limit to that i don't know when that's going to be kind of thing right and i also didn't know whether like you know hey, it wasn't like you know i knew that this was going to work very well i said we have to experiment we have to learn okay a couple years prior to that like you know we had uh, set up a, a r&d center in israel and you know how that happened uh, yaron shamir who was at uh, microsoft here he said like you know hey i'm going to go to israel and two of my you know colleagues from microsoft are we are three of us are going to israel with or without microsoft okay i'm assuming that mayer is no no interest in doing anything in israel so we are going to leave and we are going to go back and then paul paul murid said like oh my god like hey we don't want to lose these guys they are great guys kind of thing can we just set up shop there right so it was more accidental than what i call strategic and india i felt was the first time where we really thought about like you know hey there is no there isn't like you know hey this individual wants to go there or that group of people want to go there or the following 10 people want to go back to india kind of thing it was more about like you know hey how do we experiment with what distributed development could look like so that we can learn and start building that muscle once we decided that what i said was like you know hey to get the right level of cultural infusion because you don't want it to be completely redmond centric you don't want to be completely a different culture kind of thing is there a way we could tap into a n number of people who are here who are maybe interested in going back for a spell or for some time or just want to go back and i think can we use that as an opportunity to have the right level of cultural infusion as we build up an organization for scale for the long term that looks and feels like microsoft as opposed to a completely different company because it's somewhere else right so it, so to me like you know the notion of providing an opportunity for people to go back was sort of a, a means to an end but so much of the culture of the company was built around being able to have a face to face conversation and so much of trust was around I I know you because I've you know had a Starbucks with you. Do you think the development in India helped the company realize this um remote working is legal <laughs> or works? 
it it took a, it, 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 i'll tell you it's still a, it, in my opinion it's still work in progress we are still learning okay having said that remember it wasn't just india we started in india then we started in china then we sort of had enough presence through acquisitions in the bay area we started in boston for a variety of reasons right so before you realize you started like you not know, really seeing like you not know, distributed things india just happened to be like you know the farthest you know 12 hours so time zones are like the craziest kind of thing and started earlier on but it wasn't like you know hey just that one experiment we said like you know hey is, is, this is a muscle that we need to, and and even we never thought that we are going to be in a completely remote work environment like what we are today because of the pandemic right but take india for example you say there are 8000 people they are not all in the same city they are not in the same location we have one in hyderabad we have got one in bangalore we started one in the delhi noida region and i'm sure we got other kinds of people all through the country kind of thing right so even within india it's reasonably distributed is it distributed where like you know hey we don't have a critical mass in any one location not is it completely remote all the time no right that's all today's environment but the notion of like you know hey being able to take a bet whether you are like you know 10 miles away like you know between like you know kirkland and seattle or bellevue and seattle kind of thing or whether you are 1000 miles away it's again all the same thing the time zones are different but people are people and people are have to figure out how to work together kind of thing thank god like you know we got technology you know tools like you know teams and zoom and we got other kinds of you know interesting tools multiplayer collaboration tools that are coming into play that make it easier somewhat but you need to have that culture that sort of says like you know hey no matter where people are we are going to be on the same team we are going to work on the same you know set of things we have an aligned set of goals and together we are going to make it happen kind of thing and i think the work that we started in india the work that you know started in israel the work that was happening in china there was work was happening in different parts of the world gave microsoft the confidence and the ability to say like you know hey i don't need everybody here in the same and even then like you know it it's sort of a evolving thing some of the old timers at microsoft probably never got there some of them got there but today as a company we are more open to a distributed development than ever before and i think the work that we laid uh, the foundation for back in the early 90s or mid 90s definitely played a big role in that in the company you are a very um personal leader your leadership style is very much built around um knowing and being in contact with people um does this remote thing was the remote thing hard for you to figure out do you do, do you think you're good at it do you understand how to do it well to to lead people who aren't sitting across the table from you uh, again like everything else like you know, i'm sure i made mistakes along the way can kind i of think but i think with over time i've gotten pr- reasonably good at that okay because at the end of the day like the principles are the same if you treat people the right way give them the right responsibilities empower them in the right way hold them accountable in the right way and sort of know that it is a two way street for example i'll give an example right you know india is 12 hours away okay 12 uh, 12 hour time zone difference right now like in you know, a daytime here is night time there if i expect the the person that i'm working in india to always work through the night and i'm saying like you know, hey my hours are 9 to 6 here you so i don't care whether it is night uh, no 9 to morning 6 for you right may not work okay but if i take a little bit of pain if i share the pain like you know, hey some days i have to sort of stay up late at night some days you may have to get up early in the morning right but we are going to have to figure out together how to make this work and and i'm going to trust you the same way i would trust whether you sit whether in whether you are sitting in redmond or you are sitting in india but know that because you are 10000 miles away i need to have different set of tools or different set of processes to be able to manage through this i think we can make great things happen When I was in human resources for Microsoft, Bill Gates and I had more than a couple of conversations where he extolled the virtues of hallway conversations. He firmly believed that these accidental interactions were essential to creativity, and to that end we continuously relocated teams between and amongst the various buildings of the campus to facilitate this. I worked closely with the facilities people to arrange these moves and they in turn constructed buildings specifically designed to make these interactions as easy as possible. 
In fact, Microsoft is in the middle of tearing down that entire campus and constructing a massive multi-billion dollar replacement complex based in a large part on the principle that proximity accelerates creativity. I asked Soma if he felt there was a cost, not just to Microsoft, but to the world as we move to remote work and this level of hallway interaction is no longer possible. It's, it's one of these things where you gain some, you lose some. And you'll have to be thoughtful about that and you'll have to be thoughtful about how to make it work, okay? Today, there are no hallway conversations anywhere in the world, period. No matter how much you can lament about it or how much you feel bad about it, it's just not possible. Companies aren't coming to a standstill. Companies are trying to figure out like, hey, how do I make this work? What do I need to do to compensate for the lack of hallway conversations? So it's no different. Like, you know, today we are forced to do it. Back then, we were pushing ourselves to, to get into that uncomfortable zone to have to figure out to do it. So to me, like, you know, yeah, you, you miss the water cooler conversations, but there are other, other digital tools or digital ways that you can sort of, you know, enable some level of interaction. Uh, like, you know, hey, one thing that the people in India would always tell me is like, you know, God, I hate coming to Redmond. Why? You guys are in meetings all the time. When do you guys ever get work done? We don't lament about that sitting in Redmond, right? But people, you know, outside Redmond would tell you, oh my God, the meeting culture in Redmond is horrible, okay? I wish I don't have to come to Redmond as often I can come. So, you know, hey, they are more productive because they don't like spend a lot of their time in meetings, right? But they miss the hallway conversation and the, and the spontaneity of that, right? So, so you could argue that there are pros and cons or sort of gives and gets. You just have to think about what they are and think about what matters to you and how you're going to work around that given the environment that you have. And then I think it'll be phenomenal. You know, there were companies that were trying to do it um, prior to the pandemic. They were trying to figure it out and make it work. And of course, there were sticks in the mud who were saying, I wasn't going to move. And, you know, but then there were companies that were doing it and saying, and then all of a sudden, the playing field is leveled by the pandemic and everybody has to figure this out. And it'll be very interesting to see if it does spring back. You know, I, I don't know if you know Stuart Butterfield, mm -hmm. he's the CEO of Slack. That guy, you know, a couple of months ago, he made the statement, which I thought was a phenomenal statement. He said, you know, if you had gone to like, you know, the CEOs of any company that had over 100 employees and told them like, you know, you've got a week's time and all of your employees are going to be remote, the world would have panicked. The world would have rebelled against that. Except that's exactly what happened. So sometimes like, you know, what we think of as like, you know, hey, true, tried, tested practices, behaviors. We just don't want to think outside the box. We are unable to think outside the box. And sometimes we don't even need to think outside the box, right? So, but when we have to think outside the box, we rise to the occasion, right? The same Microsoft, which in the early 90s was saying like, hey, everybody's going to come here. is one of the first companies to say like, oh, I'm going to like enable like now remote working. So to me, it's, it's all about like, hey, constantly saying like, hey, what you have today may work very well, but that doesn't mean you want to be close-minded about new ideas, about new ways of doing things, right? I'll tell you, last week I was talking to somebody from GitLab. GitLab is this company that has been right from day one, all remote. Now, granted, they are not, they are not Microsoft, they are no Amazon. They got only like, you know, a uh, you know, couple thousand employees today kind of thing. But right from day one, they have tried building a culture where it's okay for people to be wherever they are. They're all part of the same company, part of the same set of, products and services serving the same set of customers and we're going to make it work and so far they are happy and this pandemic environment has only enabled them to sort of you know dig in deeper and say hey we think our model is going to work even as we scale we talk about it as like you know hey what is the future of work going to look like okay one way to think about it is we used to live in a world where we started thinking about physical first workflows okay hey i want to see you in the hallway con and that conversation is going to be helpful we start with that world. And then occasionally we think like, no, yeah, yeah, sure. If you travel to like, you know, uh, Eastern Europe, sure, I'll still will be okay working with you kind of thing, right? We and, and we know intuitively that over a period of time, we are likely to get to a world where it's going to be a digital first workflow, but know that there'll be some physical first workflows too. The pandemic has really thrown us to an extreme and said, forget digital first, physical first. You are in a digital only workflow. Figure out how to make it work. So. Whatever we thought we were going to get in terms of the future of work over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 
we are sort of on a fast track to figuring it out today. I do think we are going to snap some back to sort of a hybrid workflow, but I think the, the level of progress that we made is going to be incredibly hard to unwind completely. You know, will we take you know, a step back? Maybe we'll take a step back because like, you know, hey, we can afford to because we see like, you know, hey, some of the gives and gets that we have with not having any physical interaction is probably not the right thing. So we'll find a balance. But will we go back to like, you know, hey, we are going to build, you know, a $6 billion campus for like, you know, uh, another 10,000 people. I doubt that that day is going to come anytime soon. May never come. One of the trickiest parts about remote operations in an organization is cultural. It can be hard to strike a balance between having a uniform culture worldwide, yet still reflecting and respecting the local environment. This can be a complex and delicate dance. I asked Soma if he felt like it should be 50-50 headquarters versus remote or some other balance. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a number for you in terms of should it be 50-50 or 60-40 or 40-60 kind of thing, but I think a fusion of both is absolutely required. As, as I mentioned before, it can't be like, you know, hey, you decide that like, you know, Microsoft's culture, culture is the best culture. Uh, what, whatever is working in Redmond, and I'm going to transition that to like, you know, India and China and other parts of the world kind of thing. You also can't completely say like, you know, hey, Microsoft's culture is Microsoft's culture in Redmond. I'm going to do something in India or China or some other place, and that's going to be completely different than it. It, it won't work as well, right? So you'll have to think about like, you know, hey, what is the, what, what, what do people think locally? How do people behave locally? How do people operate locally? What works? What doesn't work? How do you marry that with like, you know, a, a Redmond culture, Microsoft culture kind of thing, so that there is some level of conformity and sort of being able to work together. I'll, I'll, let me give you one example, right? For a long time, after we started the R&D center in India, we, we, we had this problem where like, you know, people would just not talk. Like you asked me like, why am I quiet? I don't talk much in meetings, right? why? Nah, that's all I am, right? That's what a lot of Indians are, right? Uh, not every Indian, but a lot of, right? And, and, and so we would do a meeting and you know, you, you'll have like, you know, a Redmond team and the India team you know, working together on something. The Redmond folks will be talking, 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 talking kind of thing. And it'll be quite, 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 quite on the India side. And people say like, hey, do you get what we are saying? Why are you not participating? Does it mean you have no idea what we are talking about? You know, do you not have any point of view, right? It was a, a cultural issue, right? It took time for Redmond managers to understand that like, hey, we, you know, there may be other people that may not necessarily be comfortable talking in a group environment. How maybe like we should say like, hey, Chris, do you have a point of view? And then sure, you'll start saying something. And once you start, hopefully you'll get to the right point. And if I do that six times, Maybe the seventh time you'll automatically do it yourself, right? So, so you'll have to sort of, you know, get people on this side to understand that and people on that side to understand like, you know, hey, what is the value of speaking? It is not like, you know, by you uh, op uh, voicing your opinion. And people are, are scared when it is an opinion that disagrees with what somebody else is saying because their, their first thing is like, you know, hey, are you going to think that I'm insulting you or I'm not respecting you? How do I say it in a way that you sort of view it, you know, in the most constructive way, right? So there are a lot of nuances that people think through and you have to keep that in mind. And at the same time, the person there needs to understand that like, it's not about disrespect, it's not about this, it's about adding value and it's about making sure that we are doing the right thing and, and people take it in that respect, right? And, and so you'll have to work through these sort of cultural nuances, cultural issues. You know, the reason why I was excited initially about taking a number of people from here and sending them back is, hey, these people both understand the local customs because they came from that part of the world. And they've been at Microsoft long enough that they know the Microsoft culture. Can they be sort of, you know, helping us create like, you know, what I call the fusion environment that's likely to be the best, both in the context of Microsoft and what might work in one geography versus other geography. I'll tell you the other problem is like, you know, hey, and I can tell this now because I, I've, I've sort of been with all these geographies, right? You look at Israel, you've got the other problem, right? The person is like passionate and they're arguing all the time not because they want to fight with you or because they sort of think badly of you. They really are passionate about what they're saying and they want to make sure that they convey that passion, right? But for a lot of people who are not used to that, it's like, you know, hey, why are these guys antagonistic all the time? Why are they yelling all the time? Why are they shouting all the time? Oh my God, it's frustrating. No, 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 like, look, get past that emotion and think about what they are saying and maybe you'll understand why they are saying that. And it is not like, you know, they are saying they're right or they are wrong. They're just saying like, you know, hey, this is how I am, right? Because it's a cultural 
thing. And the more we can understand, like, and, and we talk about diversity and inclusion kind of thing, I think the more we understand this, the more we figure out like, you know, how to work with these people, whether they are here or whether they are in some other part of the world, uh, it's just like, you know, absolutely required for every company today. After almost 27 years at Microsoft, Soma decided to leave and join Madrona, one of Seattle's premier venture capital firms. I asked him if he left Microsoft or did he go to Madrona? Great question. So let me tell you the story again, okay? And before that, I actually want to share one, one other thought, which I think at least like I felt it was a lesson for me. I had sort of joined Microsoft and I really loved the company. I loved what I was doing kind of thing. And I'd always thought that like, you know, hey, I'm going to retire from Microsoft and be done. And that maybe 50 years from now, 100 years from now, who knows how long, but, but I'm excited about it, right? And I felt that there are three things that were important to me, okay? I want to be in an environment where I feel like I'm learning every day, which means there are people around me I feel are at least as smart and hopefully smarter than I am. So I can learn, learn, learn. That was really important to me. The second thing is, I wanted to have what I feel is an impactful job or role, kind of thing, right? Meaning whatever I was doing, I wanted to make sure that like, you know, the, the output of what I was doing and by extension my team was doing was going to have a positive impact on this world in some way, shape, or form. And the third thing is, I want to know that I'm having fun at what I'm doing. And for the 27 years, at, or at least 26 years, I should say, at Microsoft, that I felt that if these three things were there, I'm going to give it another year. I'm going to give it another year. I'm going to give it another year. I'll give it forever kind of thing. Okay? And I, I still believe those three things are super valuable. What I now realize is there is a fourth thing that I should have added, which is, hey, I, I want to learn. I want to be in an environment where I'm learning. I want to have impact. And I want to have fun. But I also should be thinking about what else. In other words, okay, hey, I may be doing well on those three dimensions, but if there is something else where I have a, an opportunity to have more of a learning opportunity, more of an impact, more fun, I should at least consider that. And I think for 26 years, I did not consider that. Okay? I never even thought about it. To me, like, you know, hey, I checkmarked the first three things. Great. I'm done. I didn't think about like, you know, hey, is there something else I could do in this world that would give me those three things and give them in spades or more, a lot more than what I'm doing, right? And I saw so my, my sort of encouragement to everybody, everybody in this world is, please think about the fourth thing as well. In other words, we all have a finite amount of time ahead of us. No matter whether I'm one day old or whether I'm 100 years old. Okay, it's finite. The best thing that we can do is be thoughtful about how best we want to use our time. It can't be like, you know, hey, I'm happy doing what I'm doing, so I'm not going to think about anything else. If there is something else that is going to be even bigger, even better, even more impactful, even more learning, even more fun, you should at least consider that. For a variety of reasons, you may say, that is not the right thing for me now. But don't not consider things. Okay? Because you really want to optimize and maximize how you use your time. And you want to be very, very, very happy with how your choices and how you're using your time. So coming back to Microsoft's story now, right? So 26 years. And, and when I had finished my 26 year, if you had told me like, you know, hey, I won't be working at Microsoft someday, I would have laughed at you. I said, what the hell are you talking about? I'm going to be here another 25 years kind of thing. Okay? Couple things happened. One is like, you know, like, like all people, like, you know, our, two, our second daughter left home. So my wife and I started thinking about like, you know, hey, we've been doing this for 25, 26 years now. Are we ready to sign up for the next 25 years? Okay? And then I started thinking about it. And I started thinking about like, you know, hey, what am I doing? What am I learning? What do I see, you know, the company doing? What do I see me doing, you know, over time kind of thing? And I started coming to a, a realization that like, you know, hey, I think I'm going to be excited about Microsoft for maybe another 10 years, maybe another 12 years. Okay. But there is going to be a time horizon in the future when I feel like I may be done with 
doing the kinds of things that I'm doing at Microsoft. Okay. And when I started thinking that way, I really panicked. Okay. Because to me, like, you know, hey, if I'm not going to be in an environment for the time horizon that I'm thinking about, why am I wasting my time there? I should have left the place yesterday, not tomorrow. And remember, 10, 12 years from now, my ability to learn something new is only going to be a little lesser. It's not going to be bigger. Okay, just the law of uh, no, natural things. Okay, I said like, no, hey, I really think, you know, health permitting and everything else, you know, being normal kind of thing. I want to be productive for at least 25 more years. I actually thought like 27 years at Microsoft, 27 more years, right? And if I don't see my next 27 years at Microsoft, and I also don't want to work for another company, then I was always clear like, hey, Microsoft is a great company. If, I, if my goal is to work for a company, I'm going to work at Microsoft. Okay, then I have to figure out what the hell am I going to learn, be something different completely, and know whether I'm going to be having fun, whether I'm going to learn, whether I'm going to be good at that, and then build a runway for 27 years. So I started getting into a panic, right? And then, like, you know, Satya and I had a conversation. Satya had a simple ask. He said, like, you know, I'm not asking you for too much. Just stay in the company for as long as I stay, and the day I leave, both of us can leave together. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, that was awesome kind of thing. But, but hey, I, I, I don't want to stop working 10 years from now. Okay, or 12 years from now, or 15 years from now. And I knew that like someday I, I was going to get up and say like, now, oh my God, do I really want to go into work today? And I don't want to face that day. So I said like, you know, hey, I would rather, you know, decide to do something different now. I also tell you another thing, if, if six months before I left Microsoft, if you had told me that I'm going to be a venture capitalist, I would have laughed at you. Mainly because I didn't know what venture capitalism meant by then. Okay. So it wasn't like, you know, I had this dream, I had this passion, I want to be a venture capitalist. I knew that like, you know, hey, I need to find something else if I want to really figure out what I'm going to do for the next 27 years. I knew it was, it might not be Microsoft. And definitely if it is not Microsoft, it's not working for another company. I better go figure it out. Better go figure it out, right? So that was the push and drive finally for me to say, I need to leave. And it took me, and, and the Microsoft was very gracious. They said like, hey, continue here or go talk to this person or go talk here. What about this? What about that kind of thing? And it took me like, you know, so it was a, it was a long process. It was really a nine to 10 month process in my mind before I finally, not only I had to make the decision, but I had to talk to people around me to make sure that like, hey, everybody felt comfortable that this was the right decision at that point in time for me and for the company to say like, hey, let's let this guy go and do something else. But, but, and you just said it though, venture capitalism, I mean, you had never even seen a startup, right? I mean, I, 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 that's an exaggeration for effect, but I mean, Microsoft was not a startup when you joined. So, uh, um, uh, aside from learning a heck of a lot, how do you feel like you can add value to a startup? So a couple of things. One is like, you know, with, uh, by chance or like, you know, by choice, I don't know what it is kind of thing. My only interaction other than like, you know, of course, like, you know, hey, understanding what the developer world looked like from a startup perspective and engaging with startups to make sure that we are aware of the trends kind of thing. I had uh, started writing checks as angel investors in companies. It was mainly because like, you know, hey, my friend would like you now left Microsoft would say like, hey, I'm going to start a company. Can you invest? Said, sure. And, and my involvement was like, you know, maybe spending an hour with the entrepreneur and writing a check and then forgetting about it. So I can't tell you that I knew a lot about startups other than like, you know, I've written checks to startups, right? But, but what I, what, the, one of the things that I realized like in talking to all these entrepreneurs over the years in a variety of contexts is the one thing that is common among all entrepreneurs is their passion an energy to want to change the world, right? Everybody dreams about changing the world. Now, some of them obviously go do it and some of them like, you know, get a little way into that and some of them fail miserably, but it doesn't matter. Everybody has that passion kind of thing, okay? So as I was thinking about leaving Microsoft, one of the things I started thinking about, what would I do next, right? I don't know, right? There are, it, it quickly came to my mind there are only two things that I could realistically do based on whatever knowledge and experience I have. One is I have this brilliant idea that I'm willing to dedicate the next 15 years of my life to and go run my own company, okay? Uh, 
But and the reason I said 15 years is because it takes that amount of time for everybody thinking that like companies become overnight success. It takes at least 15 years for you to create some enterprise value of some consequence. So I need to be ready for that. And I need to be passionate about the problem, passionate about the problem space kind of thing. And I quickly realized that like, you know, hey, I don't have that, uh, that brilliant idea that I'm excited about for the next 15 years, right? The only other thing that I could think of was like, you know, hey, can I work with entrepreneurs and help them? Like I have a little bit of experience, you know, building products, you know, running teams, you know, building teams, scaling up teams, you know, selling to customers, you know, you know building businesses kind of thing. So if I can take all of that and if I can sort of somehow work with one or more entrepreneurs to help them, is that going to keep me busy? Is that going to keep me, you know, uh, excited? Is that a learning experience for me? Am I going to be valuable? Am I going to be good at that? I didn't know any of those things, right? Uh, but I felt like, you know, hey, I could see myself, you know, trying at least my hand at that. So when I went into Medrana, my sort of deal with Medrana, their deal with me was like, you know, hey, we are going to give this a shot because remember, I'm this guy who's sort of, you know, uh, not written code in a long time, has managed thousands and thousands of people in large company environment, n- nothing to do with like, you know, startups kind of thing. And I've always had like an army of people with me to do a lot of things that I, I wasn't an individual contributor in any way, shape or form for a long time. And I'm going to give all that up and say like, you know, hey, I'm going to be great at being an individual contributor. Not only that, I'm going to enjoy like, you know, being an investor and sort of, you know, working with entrepreneurs and really adding value and making the right investment choices so that we can sort of be a successful venture capital firm, right? There's a lot of unknowns. But thankfully, Medina guys said like, oh yeah, we, we, know, we know a little bit about you. We've heard of you, like, come on over, let's try it out. And I said, sure, we'll try it out kind of thing. So I went in thinking that like, hey, I'm going to learn for a year or two and I'm going to either decide that this is amazing and I'm going to do this or, you know, oh my God, this sucks or who knows what else will happen, right? But I would say in about like, you know, three to six months for me, it was for me. It was obvious that like, you know, hey, I think I can do okay at this. I think I can add a lot of value and I think I'm going to enjoy this. So within a year, we sort of formalized like, you know, the, you know that I'm going to be a managing director at Medrana kind of thing. And now it's five years kind of thing. I can't still tell you whether I'm a great venture capitalist or not, but I'm, I'm, I know that I'm learning every day and I'm going to do my best kind of thing. Uh, but, but it's one of those things that like, you know, so I would say I'm an accidental venture capitalist because I had a set of parameters and thoughts about like, you know, how I want to spend my time. And I'm, I'm so glad I'm doing what I'm doing now. Are you um, helping to advise these companies? Are you making decisions about investments that should be made? Are you, what is your role? What are you trying to, you know, you, you said you want to wake up every day and feel like you're being productive. Uh, how are you doing that? I would say it's all of the above. As a, as a managing director of a venture capital firm, what do you do is you, you have to do all of the above, right? It starts with like, you know, hey, fundraising to get funds from our LPs, right? And then it's all about like, you know, hey, looking at new entrepreneurs and new companies and deciding where you make investment decisions. And once you make an investment decision, you get on the board of a company and then you work with that company for the next 10 years, 15 years through their journey kind of thing. So I like to do all of those things, right? So I enjoy like, you know, all aspects of what I'm doing today, right? Because to me, like, you know, I've never fundraised in my life. That's a fantastic experience. You learn a, a different skill set. You build a different set of muscles. You build a different, you know, set of capabilities in the process, right? I love managing, you know, being a part of a management team for a firm where like, you know, as I mentioned before, there's no, it's not like anybody works for me. I work for somebody kind of thing, but we are a team that has got a loosely governed our set of governance you know, policies and rules for how the team works together. And being at the top of the firm gives me an opportunity to sort of help shape uh, the strategy and the direction and the culture along with my sort of you know, co-managing directors kind of thing. I enjoy that a lot, right? Being able to sort of you know, talk to entrepreneurs and sort of look around the corner and think about like, hey, what is going to be the next big thing? And which is the team you want to take a bet on the next big thing? And, and knowing that, you know, hey, there is a roll of the dice here. Hopefully over time, you'll sort of build better intuition and better capability to do that. But that investment decision. And the one thing I learned, like, which, which I did not appreciate at all before I sort of went into venture capital is, particularly my bad habit as an angel investor where I would write a check and forget about it. I didn't, I didn't really appreciate that, like, you know, hey, once I write a check as a venture capitalist, I'm really getting into a marriage with an entrepreneur for the next 15 years. Okay? It's a long-term relationship and a long-term work. It isn't about like, you know, hey, I come in, I write a check, and then occasionally I'll show for a board meeting kind of thing. 
you roll up your sleeves and you work hand in hand with the entrepreneur you work with the management team you do your part to be helpful to the team whether it is hiring recruiting whether it is like you know thinking about product strategy whether it's think about go to market strategy whether it's thinking about pricing and packaging right uh, whether it's about who to fire because they are not doing well it's a lot of things but but it's it's it, the thing is you are one step removed from sort of the person who's uh, who's actually running the show right so i have to be uh, both understanding and aware and think about like you know how i can be influential in the most effective and constructive way in the process the other thing that it strikes me that that you get today that you didn't get before is phenomenal variety at Microsoft, I mean, one of the things I remember when I first got there, I felt like a kid in a candy store because there were so many different things to do and so many different ways to do something. But you ended up having to do one of them for three or four years at a time. And, and you have the situation now where you can do something for three or four hours at a time. Completely agree with that. OK, uh, so if you ask me, like, you know, hey, why am I excited being a venture capitalist kind of thing? I would say there are two reasons. One is the depth and breadth of technologies that I get to be a part of. It's like completely new. It's like a kid in a candy store, like you said, kind of thing, right? Uh, because like, you know, hey, I get to work with autonomous vehicles, you know, with one company. I get to work on like, you know, hey, how can I detect, you know, early ca cancer in an early stage so that I can, you know, help the world at large. Third is like, you know, hey, how do I, with this COVID-19 thing, is there a way to sort of, you know, increase the capability for how we can test and detect faster, okay? The fourth thing I'm thinking about, like, you know, hey, uh, how do I sort of, you know, uh, reimagine what productivity tools could look like? Okay. Or the fifth company is like, you know, hey, with all this, like, you know, sort of uh, remote work online kind of thing, is there a way to reimagine how corporate learning and training should happen in online world? Right. So the, the range of the problem spaces, the breadth and depth of the technologies is phenomenal. So that's one reason. And the second reason is, as I mentioned earlier, the notion that I get to work with people who have the passion and energy to want to change the world and do that every day, every hour of the day kind of thing. That's like, you know, highly infectious. And I love that. Those are the two reasons. So you're right in that, like, you know, hey, the breadth and depth of technologies is amazing. And I love that. Right. And, and I say, like, you know, hey, even if I were running a company like Microsoft, there is a finite amount of things that I'm going to be doing. Whereas here as a venture capitalist, we really have the opportunity to, to dream as big, to think as wide, right? To go as deep on, on a variety of things that are sort of real problems to be solving, hopefully things that are going to move the dial in some meaningful ways in the world uh, over time kind of thing. And that's a very fulfilling part of being a venture capitalist. Yeah, it's just, it's making me smile just thinking about it. It's just absolutely fascinating. Um, you went off and, and ran the developer division or whatever it was for, for years at a time. And you woke up every day thinking, you know, having to think about, about a given problem. Um, do you worry that you don't get an opportunity to deep dive into any of these problems? Absolutely. It's one of those gives and gets. I don't get to deep dive into any one thing, uh, you know, to the extent that I was able to do when I was at Microsoft. But you have to decide like, you know, hey, do you want to go deep in one thing or do you want to sort of, you know, go a little, uh, little less deeper or a little more shallower, but across a wide variety of things, right? I feel like, you know, hey, I spent a considerable amount of time working on like, you know, something that is deeper, some, you know, something that is a little more constrained in terms of the focus kind of thing. And now I'm really enjoying the breadth of technology that I get a chance to look at. And, the, and I feel like all the foundational work that I did or that I learned or that I experienced while at Microsoft, you know, working on platforms, working on developer-related technologies, right? Thinking about the world of computing. I think I, I can take all of those things and apply it to a broader technology base today than ever before. Like, you know, again, three years ago, if you had told me like I would be working with a company on like, you know, hey, how do I detect cancer earlier? I said, well, I don't know anything about cancer kind of thing. But in today's day and age, you know, where life sciences is coming together with data science and computer science. And that intersection of innovation is sort of, you know, something where we think there is a huge opportunity for innovation and breakthrough. We have an opportunity to go play in that. And that's, a, oh my God, that's like, you know, new muscle for me. And I'm never going to be a life sciences guy, let's be clear. But I can be learning enough to be dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've taken way too much of your time. This has been absolutely a blast. I, I really enjoyed this. This is fun. Um, Absolutely. I should tell you two things here. One is 
I'm really glad you're doing this because <laughs> because because I think this this notion of sort of you know letting people sort of you know uh, voice their opinions and being able to sort of you know think about how you can sort of channelize that into something that like you know maybe others would love to hear kind of thing. I think that's a fantastic and today's day and age like you know the the podcast is probably like you know as effective as a medium as anything else for us to be able to sort of you know hear each other's perspectives and he, each other's views kind of thing so thank you for doing that and right from the microsoft days it's always been a pleasure you know chatting with you so i really enjoyed the last two hours so I, thank you i just I, i this has been as much fun as i could have hoped for so you're you're a really good guy thank you very much thank you I want to thank Soma again for spending the time with us. He's right. The chance to hear other smart and thoughtful leaders is always time well spent. Leading Smart is from me, Chris Williams. You can find out more about the show and discover other resources for leaders at my website, clwill.com. If you like the show, please share it with your friends, especially on social media. Referrals are the greatest source of new listeners. I'd also love your feedback. I'm the CL Will on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook or send an email to pod at clwill.com. That's it for this episode. The next episode will continue the series on communication. It's called Feedback Loop. I hope you'll listen. Until then, please remember that each of the several dozen decisions you make today are part of Leading Smart. <laughs>